Xin chào, tên tôi là Nguyễn Thị Thủy, thành viên ban biên tập tạp chí nghiên cứu Việt Mỹ và là nghiên cứu sinh ngành chính trị học Đại học Oregon. Đây là phần 2 của chương trình trao đổi giữa tạp chí nghiên cứu Việt Mỹ và giáo sư Priscilla Southwell, bà là giáo sư ngành chính trị Hoa Kỳ, khoa chính trị học Đại học Oregon. Cảm ơn quý vị đã xem bài giảng và đặt câu hỏi cho giáo sư Southwell. Chúng tôi đã thu thập và nhóm các câu hỏi theo từng chủ đề. Sau đây, giáo sư Southwell sẽ trả lời các câu hỏi và chia sẻ quan điểm của bà. Professor Southwell, thank you very much for being with us today. Many of our Vietnamese audience watched your lecture and have some questions for you. I would like to present the questions on the screen here and can't wait to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, I am Priscilla so, Southwell and it's nice to see you again. So we're going to now um, address, uh, I'm going to do it as well as I can, some of your questions which were very pertinent and very relevant and I can understand why you would still have continuing questions. So Thuy, let's start with the first question. So this is, can you say a bit more about the historical context of the Electoral College and why did the framers of the Constitution feel afraid of the power of the mass? Um, so I don't know how many people are familiar with the fact that our current constitution in the United States is actually the second constitution that we have had since we became a country. And so the first constitution was very short lived. It only was around, it was called the Articles of Confederation. It was only around and effective for eight years from 1781 to 1789. And it was a very different kind of government then. It was very decentralized and gave a lot of power to the states. And I can understand why people who lived in the uh, uh, original 13 states wanted that kind of government initially because they were concerned about the all-powerful monarch and why they had even had the American Revolution. However, there were a lot of problems with the Articles of Confederation. So this giving, giving sovereign power or power to the states was uh, sounded very good in terms of all of the 13 states wanting to be able to control their governing bodies. But it became a problem for various reasons, no common currency, no ability to uh, figure out trade between states, etc. But probably the most um, crucial problem is relevant to what I'm saying about the uh, fear of the masses was that during that time, it was a, kind of a difficult it was actually an economic recession. And there were lots of uh, debtors and there were uh, also attempts by certain states to deal with that by raising taxes. And so what happened, the historical event uh, was called the Shays Rebellion in 1787. And it was primarily uh, concentrated in Western Massachusetts, but these were debtors, these were farmers, uh, and they rose up in an actual um, violent um, uh, rebellion and in many cases stole flour. Um, and it was contagious across other states, not just Massachusetts, but they were engaged in civil unrest, but it was also sometimes turned violent, as I mentioned. And that gave a lot of the leaders of these 13 states, even those outside of Massachusetts, a great deal of concern about the fact that there was no way that the national government could raise an army or a navy to help with this insurrection. And Massachusetts had a very difficult time uh, putting down these dissenters, which, uh, and they had, you know, in, in, in every sense, they were in dire economic straits. But the uh, the wealthier white inhabitants and oft, often merchants and well-established um, businessmen were very concerned about this. And so they, that's one reason why they came together in the uh, convention, the Constitutional Convention in 1787, and created a government that was much more centrally uh, had much more power in the national government, had decided in the uh, basically the Federalist Papers argued very strongly that uh, they didn't say we're worried about the power of the masses, but they said, we have to be aware that the divisions, the economic divisions in any society between the haves and the have nots is going to promote unrest. And we have to be very wary of, in their view, their very elitist view that the masses or the average, if, that, if that's such a, a good term, the average person, um, partly because he or she is sometimes having economic troubles and whatever is going to turn to violence. And that's why I was saying this one rebellion in Massachusetts 
led them to be very fearful of the common person. And that's why even voting rights were constrained. Women were not allowed to vote and people who would not, did not own property oh, in, initially in the even in our new constitution we're not allowed to vote and so the electoral college is part of that sentiment same thing with um indirect election of senators that was um senators u.s senators used to be chosen by state legislatures until 1913 when there was the 17th constitutional amendment so so there were all kinds of what they would have regarded safeguards against the average person voting because frankly they didn't trust that person and it's as i said very elitist and gradually over the years um, we have chipped away at this obviously women have the right to vote um, african americans have the right to vote um, and senators are, are directly elected by people in a, in a popular election but the one kind of relic um, or anachronism, as I would call it, is the Electoral College. And that's caused a great deal of consternation um, over the last uh, two decades or so, because we have had two elections, 2000 and 2016, where the popular vote winner did not actually get elected as president. And uh, it narrowly, uh, we narrowly escaped this fate in 2020, but I think enough people are concerned about this. Reforming it, changing it, getting rid of it is going to be um, rather difficult. There are some suggested reforms out there that people are certainly debating in uh, 2020, and I'm sure they will um, until, um, <laughs> until there's some kind of change, sorry. Um, so um, I think Tweet, we can go on to the next question. Yes, thank you. So um, norms, uh, norms that help democracy vote. Uh, what exactly are the our norms, et cetera, and, and why and how can they help democracy? And why don't we make all of them into laws? Norms are just sort of implied standards of conduct. It's uh, I guess a more casual way to put it is doing the right thing. And in terms of democracy, there is one kind of norm uh, that you should vote, that you should participate when you have the opportunity to, to do that. It's a norm. It's a good thing. It's something that people are taught at an early age, either by their family members or at school, and certainly in terms of um, yeah, higher education as well. These are the proper ways of behavior. And um, so that's that those are the kind of norms it doesn't mean that a norm has to be always um the conventional norm there are also norms in the united states that if you um disagree with a policy you have a right to protest in one way or another you write a letter to your member of congress or as has happened um uh not just recently but through all of my lifetime people protest and they protest usually peacefully i think there is a norm in the united states that uh, yes, you can get out on the streets. Yes, you can carry cards and you can um, do whatever you can to criticize either a politician in office or what he or she is doing in terms of policy or proposed law. So these are norms, but they're, they're, um, they're not universal. And I should say that there are some people who disagree about certain norms. Um, there are different codes of conduct within different families and within uh, even members of uh, a family. So they're not... Um, they're not cast in stone to use the, the cliche. They're not an absolute given because as I said, people can differ, disagree. So you have a sense of this is the right thing to do. But I think there's a recognition that we uh, there's a, a difference. I mean, American, American society has a lot of norms that are widespread, but they're not universal. So um, Tweet, I think that's we can great. Go on. Thank Question. you. Yeah. Okay. So now we move to oh, question three, yeah. Oh, okay, voter suppression. This is a, a very controversial issue in the United States. It's not as if it hasn't gone on for since the very beginning. I mentioned in the, the first question that in the beginning of the Republic in 1789, women weren't allowed to vote. Uh, slaves weren't allowed to vote. Uh, they, in essence, uh, incarcerated African-Americans and people who didn't own any property. 
Um, so that that itself is voter suppression from the very beginning. Now, but it continues, even though African Americans and women now have the right to vote and there are no property requirements, there are all kinds of tactics that various groups in society, um, often political parties, have taken to prevent people from voting. Um, so some people will say that even the fact that we have election days on Tuesdays is a certain amount of voter suppression because it's sometimes very difficult for voters to get to the polling place on a Tuesday if they work long hours, if they don't have adequate transportation. Now, the state of Oregon and an increasing number of states um, have vote by mail. So that, uh, that kind of obstacle has been removed, thank heaven. But nonetheless, there are still uh, people who find it very difficult to get to the polling place um, on a specific day. And there are also lots of people that have um, unexpected difficulties that arise. They could have a mother that broke her hip. They could be hospitalized themselves. They could have car trouble, all of these things. And so a lot of people say even the way the date that we have elections is a, voter, a form of voter suppression. But there are all kinds of other things that are done currently that um, people are fighting back against. One is um, requiring people to have an ID, an official ID. Uh, before you can um, either vote by mail, in which case sometimes you even have to have a witness um, to it, but um, even an ID when you show up at the polling place. Now, most people have some kind of ID, but for a lot of people, especially new immigrants, but who are new citizens and whose language ability might not be um, quite up to understanding all of the procedures about how you get this ID and what you do, it is a, a form of voter suppression. Now, the people who are in, in uh, favor of voter ID say they're just upholding integ the vote integrity, making sure that the person who is voting is really who he or she says he is. But nonetheless, it is a problem. All kinds of things um, in uh, people who have served, been charged with and served their time for a felon, felony have, they are convicted felons, but who are no longer incarcerated, or even ones who are, in certain states have the right to vote, in certain states they don't. And it's very, very difficult waters to wade through. So for example, in Florida, the voters passed a ballot measure last year, allowing felons who had served their sentence to vote in this election. And then the Florida state legislature decided, no, we're not, we're not gonna do that. And they passed a law saying, uh, those felons, uh, despite the, the popular vote in the ballot measure, those felons have, cannot vote until they pay off all of their fines and fees that are owed the county government or the state government, which for many people was thousands of dollars. That's voter suppression. And it's actually going against the will of the people of Florida, the voters of Florida. So um, all kinds of states have different rules on how you remove someone from the list of registered voters. If you don't vote for in the, in the last presidential election, sometimes you are removed or what's called purged. And so if you decide, if you, for example, if you did not vote in the 2016 election, but very much wanted to vote in the 2020 election, you would have to re-register. These are barriers. These are things that prevent legitimate voters from voting. And uh, so it's a long, long list. And the, unfortunately, the United States has had a very colorful history of this. There were many in, in the, what's called the Deep South, the Southern states who were interested in uh, suppressing the black vote or the African-American vote. They would put in poll taxes, they would put in literacy tests, anything to prevent people from voting. So, <coughs> excuse me, the next part of the question, who benefits from such, such suppression? Uh, the people who want to see a certain group of individuals not vote. So in the example, carrying on the example I uh, gave his, of the historical uh, South, white political leaders did not want African-Americans to vote. So they threw every obstacle they possibly could. And it actually took the US Supreme Court and actually the passage of a legislation that did not occur until the 1960s. Um, that basically uh, er eroded that kind of disenfranchisement of uh, African Americans. So now in the, in the contemporary situation and what's happening currently, I will be very frank, the Republican Party has done a great deal to um, suppress certain voters from voting. 
So for example, in um, Texas, um, a lot of people during the pandemic um, wanted to vote by mail or vote, it, vote absentee. And um, you can, in most states, Oregon is one of them, when you vote by mail or you vote absentee, there are, you don't have to go to the polling place, obviously, but you um, can, and you don't always have to mail it in, you can drop it off in a drop box. So it's an official large box, it looks like a mailbox, and there's usually, like the, in my county, there are about, oh, probably 20 to 25 drop off sites. They're always, you know, fairly close to where someone lives. They can usually walk there they, or it's a short drive. However, in Texas, they decided um, for some reason um, that there would only be one drop off box per county. So uh, in Harris County, where Houston is, a very highly populated area, there was one drop off box. That's clear voter suppression. And I think what it was is they were trying to um, the Republican uh, leadership was trying to suppress the vote of lower income people, predominantly people who were African American or Asian or um, uh, Latina uh, who wanted to vote and found would have found it a lot easier to do so if they had a drop off box, but those people were awful, also shown to be more likely to vote for uh, uh, former Vice President um, Joe Biden. So. You benefit from it if you try to hold down the vote of your opposition. And that's in essence what um, has led to so many lawsuits um, across the nation. Okay. That was very informative. Thank you. And now okay. we move to question four. All right, as I've um, talked about all of these undemocratic elements in um, the American system, the American democratic system, and yes, we have a lot of work to do. And I think the 2020 election certainly underscored it. Now, is there any system that is more democratic than the American system? I can't answer that fully because my only other area of expertise is European politics. But I, um, I will say that in most European countries, and uh, they use for a good portion of their elections a proportional representational system. And I know it's used widespread, uh, use, is widespread use in um, Asia and in Latin America as well. I just don't know the specific uh, countries. But I think that is a much more democratic way of electing members to your uh, national legislature because it allows it allows for what we call third and fourth parties or minority parties to at least get some seats in, in the national legislature. So in the United States and in the UK and uh, to a certain extent a few elections in France, they don't use proportional representation. They use basically they have districts and they elect one person from each district to be a deputy to be a, um, or in the United States, a representative to the US House, or in the case of the UK, someone who becomes a member of parliament. So they alone only allow, it's called single member district form of representation as opposed to proportional representation, and they only elect one person. So what does that mean in any one of these districts in France or the UK or the United States? It means that for the person to, to be declared the winner, um, he, he or she just has to come get the highest number of votes. It could be only 40% of all the votes cast. You just have to have a plurality. And so there can be many cases, and there have been in all of these three countries and elsewhere that uh, it sometimes use this, Canada and Australia, uh, New Zealand, part of this sort of British system uh, tend to uh, use it too, but they've reformed faster. Um, when you do this, it means that in some cases you will have an election in a particular district and a majority of people will have voted for another candidate other than the one who was declared the winner because he or she got the most votes or the plurality. But in, in contrast with a place like um, Germany or um, Italy or Spain and all of those times, what happens is if a party gets 30% of the vote, it's likely to get roughly, because of proportional representation, roughly 30% of the seats in the national legislature. Now, for example, in the United States, if, um, if a party got 30% of the vote in all 435 House districts, they would end up with no representatives in the US House. So that's, I think, um, a way that 
that's very undemocratic. And it's one reason why um, we have two parties that have stayed in power and just alternated for many, many years. And I think the um, richness of other countries like Germany and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece, all of those countries that allow for proportional representation and you know, France does it say for um, elections to the European Parliament, it allows for much more diversity of opinion and certainly allows for third and fourth parties to remain viable. The next question is a hard one. Um, if we were going to adapt to a newer, better system in terms of abolishing the Electoral College, uh, campaign financing is, is absolutely miserable um, in the United States. It certainly is in Oregon where there are no limits whatsoever. All these kinds of new and better systems would usually require the support of people who are currently in office. So in other words, a, a constitutional amendment uh, requires two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate or three quarters of the state legislatures uh, say to get rid of the electoral college. So that's unlikely to happen because frankly, um, any kind of senator or representative um, or state legislator that is from a rural, less populous state is unlikely to vote for the abolishment of the electoral college because smaller rural states have a distinct advantage um, under the current electoral college. Frankly, they get so much more power than um, da, does anyone else. So um, it's just something, it's, it's very difficult to uh, do reform legislation when the people that you are asking to initiate the reform are people who are part of the status quo. That is, they have benefited from the current system and they are unlikely to risk their career if it means adjusting to or creating a new system that might um, prevent them from being reelected, might prevent them from raising the huge amounts of money that they have. It's a very kind of uh, dismal picture here, but I think it's a, a reality. In, the, in regard to the Electoral College, the only sort of glimmer of hope that I can see is a initiative which began several years ago and is building steam. It's called the National Popular Vote. And it may be a little more uh, complicated than you need to hear, but the, what it is in Oregon is a signatory. It's, it's a compact of states that agree that whatever, regardless of whatever the voters in their state, whoever they cast the presidential vote for, um, uh, if another candidate wins the popular vote nationwide, their electoral votes in defiance of how they voted in their own state would always be cast for the popular vote winner. Now it's not in effect now, it will only go into effect when enough states, and it's getting closer, enough states sign on to it, agree and be part of this compact such that um, it would reach the magical 270, which is you have to get 270 electoral votes in order to declare the winner of the presidential election. So if indeed in the next, no, I don't know, two, three, four, 10 years, enough states sign on to that, then it actually is a kind of clever sort of uh, backdoor way of abolishing the electoral college without relying on US Congress or the state legislatures. In other words, it's almost an extra constitutional move, but it uh, states do have a uh, certain amount of discretion about how they uh, allocate their electoral votes. So that may be the way that um, this um, institution of the uh, electoral college is toppled. I'm a little optimistic about it. All right, next question. All right, certainly there's a lot of work to be done, but there's hope too, thank you. Um, <laughs> our next question is also our last question for today. Yes. Okay, so what do American people generally think about their election and their democracy? Do they think it's the, believe it's the best in the world and do many people realize that there are many loopholes in the system? I think in general, um, American people um, are very patriotic. They, they uh, support their country. They, they like being an American. They like being a US citizen. However, I think they are very disillusioned about politics and about elections and political parties. And so 
they they may be very um, very much in love with their country, but they're not in love with how the government is run and how elections are run. And so this is actually referred to in the political science literature as political alienation, that people feel alien as if they were from outer space, or they feel a, a great deal of separation and distance from politicians, even those that they may have voted for. Um, and they certainly feel very um, concerned about the, the amount of money that swirls around in American politics and in, and in the electoral process. They certainly don't like the electoral college for the most part. I haven't seen any recent polls, but generally people are uh, sort of just, uh, you know, are very puzzled and uh, mystified, if not dismayed about the electoral college. So there, but it's more than just the electoral college. I think they're, they often feel that elected politicians and even the institutions of Congress and the presidency and even the judiciary are, don't understand their problems. They have very little understanding of what it's like to be unemployed, what it's like to be worried about paying your mortgage payment, what it's like to be homeless, what it's like to be uh, what's called food insecure, not an, not have enough money to buy basic food uh, stuff to feed your family. And so they feel a, a distance. And so this alienation is is uh, been rising. It's been rising actually for a long time. It's been rising since Watergate. It's been rising um, in all the public opinion polls since the early 70s. And, you know, scandals have something to do with it. The um, Frankly, the conduct of the Vietnam War certainly led to a, a great deal of this growing alienation. So it's not just about domestic policies, it's about foreign policies. And um, so clearly the second uh, question, they do not believe it's the best in the world. I don't know if they have an understanding of proportional representation or what goes on in other countries, but I think they do, they do know about, for example, that healthcare systems are much better in many, many other countries uh, in the world. They do know a lot about um, even the kind of basic figures about uh, life ex expectancy is not as high as it should be in the United States, maternal mortality, infant mortality in the United States is much higher than many other developed countries of the world. Uh, obviously it's better than um, a lot of other countries, but nonetheless in comparison to a lot of Latin American and Asian and European countries, the United States falls down on even these basic indicators about quality of life. So I do think that back to the elections, people do realize that there are loopholes in the system. They do, I think a lot of people are concerned about um, how much money is given uh, legally to uh, elected politicians or even candidates. Um, and they wonder, you know, how much does this affect uh, the, the politicians vote on policy issues that might uh, benefit wealthy people in US society, but not uh, so much other people in society. And so I, and I think many people are coming to realize that there are many loopholes in the system. So again, as uh, Twee has said, the United States is um, <laughs> got a lot of work to do in terms of even how they conduct their elections and run their government. Excellent. Um, that was a great learning opportunity for us. Thank you, Professor Salswell, uh, for being with us today and share with us your wisdom. We hope to see you uh, again in the near future for more lectures and a Q and A section. Thank you. That would be great. All right. Enjoy. <laughs>